Welcome to the first episode in a Legendarium series called The Greatest Knights. In this episode about William Marshall, we will focus on the knight's rough beginnings in life, his education, and his rise as a tournament champion. Then we will talk about how he became tutor in arms to the heir to the English throne, an earl, and finally saved the Plantagenet dynasty. William Marshall was born in 1146, 80 years after the Norman conquest of England. His father, John Marshall, was a French-speaking custodian of Newbury Castle during the years when King Stephen and the Empress Matilda fought for the throne of England and Normandy. In 1152, when William was only six years old, King Stephen laid siege to Newbury and forced John Marshall to give up his son as a hostage during peace negotiations. Instead, John took advantage of the quiet to restock his castle. Incensed, King Stephen placed the six-year-old William into a catapult and threatened to hurl him into the walls. John Marshall glibly replied, I have the hammer and anvil to make more and better sons. Fortunately, King Stephen could not bring himself to murder a child and instead made William a royal ward. That proved fortunate because William had several older brothers who would surely inherit their father's estates, leaving William with nothing. So King Stephen soon sent young William to William de Tonkerville, Chamberlain of Normandy. The Chamberlain ran a military academy where William learned how to be a knight. Back then, England lived under something akin to an apartheid system, with French-speaking descendants of William the Conqueror's Normans monopolizing political and church offices, while most English toiled anonymously on farms owned by the Normans. Among other French-speaking youths, William learned how to ride and fight. The armor used in William's time had not changed much from the Norman conquest. Male coats extended to the knees to protect thighs, while male leggings and spurred boots protected the lower legs and feet. Pot helmets with slits to see through allowed knights to avoid disfiguring facial wounds. Part of William's training included developing the stamina and strength needed to ride a horse for hours while wearing full armor in midsummer heat. William practiced with his sword so often that he had a lopsided appearance, his right shoulder and arm overdeveloped in contrast to his left side. William also learned riding. He could ride a horse in a zigzag pattern to avoid fire, stop on a dime, and have his horse kick with his front feet or bite the enemy. William must have impressed his teachers because he was dubbed a knight by the age of 20 and was sent to fight in the war between the Count of Boulogne and King Henry II of England and Normandy. During skirmishes around the castle of Neuchâtel in Bray in Normandy, William rashly charged into battle against Tonkerville's wishes and his horse was killed under him. As punishment, Tonkerville refused to give William a replacement. So, William sold his clothes to buy a new horse and replenished his funds by entering the tournaments in 1167. Tournaments were not the ordered sport they became later, with two knights charging each other along separated tracks. The 12th century tournament featured two teams of fully armed and armored knights attacking each other with any weapons at hand. They chased each other for miles around the countryside, damaging crops and property, and riding down anyone unlucky enough to get in their way. Officially, they were supposed to dismount rather than kill each other. However, that didn't stop knights from clubbing or stabbing fallen enemies to death, crushing limbs and skulls with maces or axes. To stave off such a fate, a knight had to surrender, which meant paying a ransom or losing their horse, arms, and armor. For a poor knight like William, entering the tournament must have been a great risk. He might lose his armor, horse, even his life, yet he excelled. William's first time out, he won four and a half horses, with the half a horse likely a prize split with another knight. William hit the tournament circuit again in 1168, partnering with a Flemish knight named Roger de Gaugui. During one battle, William's helmet was so bashed by opposing knights that he needed a blacksmith to remove it. 
Despite that, William captured 103 knights during those two years. In 1168, William went back to fighting real warfare, fighting with the Earl of Salisbury in Poitou. William was injured and captured by French nobleman Guy de Lusigny. While a prisoner, a lady of the castle gave William a piece of moldy bread with which to clean his wounds, a mercy which probably saved his life. Fortunately, William's tournament exploits had caught the eye of Queen Eleanor of Aquitaine, wife of King Henry II. Not only did Eleanor pay his ransom, but she made him tutor in arms to her eldest son, Henry the Young King, who had been crowned a year ago as associate king to his father, Henry II. For the next 12 years, William became the young king's mentor and tournament team manager, winning enough money to maintain his own entourage of knights. On his deathbed, William claimed to have captured 500 knights on the tournament field. William also followed the young king in an abortive rebellion against his father, Henry II, in 1173. According to his biographer, William knighted the young king during the rebellion. After the rebellion's end, William continued as Henry's tournament manager until the young king died of dysentery, not long after making an oath to fight in the Crusades. The dying young king asked William to go in his place. Henry even gave William his cloak to take to the Holy Land. After two years of crusading, William returned home, and he came back just in time to join a civil war which pitted King Henry II against his two surviving sons, John and Richard, who had allied with King Philip II of France. During this war, William defeated Prince Richard in battle. When Richard begged for mercy, William instead killed Richard's horse only to punish the prince while still sparing his life. After the death of King Henry II in 1189, Richard became king and repaid William's mercy by giving the 43-year-old knight a 17-year-old bride, Isabel de Clare, heiress to the fabulously wealthy second Earl of Pembroke. The penniless tourney knight became one of the richest men in England. While King Richard went on crusade, William rebuilt his new castles, using designs he saw in the Holy Land. William also served on the Council of Regency that ruled England and Normandy in King Richard's absence. He even took the title Marshal of England in 1194. However, fortune changed again with Richard's death in 1199 and the ascension of King John. John proved an utter disaster as king. First, John lost the ancestral homeland of Normandy to the French. Then, John overtaxed England for ten years to pay for the reconquest of Normandy. Indeed, John attempted to seize some of William's estates in eastern Ireland to help fund the war effort. William spent several years in Ireland fighting off the king's men and looking after his interests there. Yet after all those taxes, John still lost to the French in 1214. Small wonder that William Marshall lent his support to the barons, becoming one of the creators and signatories of Magna Carta, which curbed the powers of the monarchy and established the principle, at least in theory, that a man should be spared arbitrary punishment. However, no sooner had John signed the document than he declared it null and void. Outraged, the barons invited Prince Louis, heir to the French throne, to become their new king. That was a step too far for William. Had William joined Prince Louis, it would have surely ended the Plantagenet dynasty. Instead, William Marshall became one of the few notables to support King John. His task became much easier when King John died in 1217, leaving his nine-year-old son Henry III as king. With the hated John out of the picture, English nobles began deserting Prince Louis. At the age of 70, William Marshall led the royal army in one final battle against Lincoln, personally charging the Franco-rebel army and crushing them. Afterwards, William prepared to lay siege to London, where Prince Louis holed up. 
However, William never had to lay siege as the prince's fleet was destroyed in the English Channel. With no hope of resupply or reinforcement, Prince Louis left England peacefully. For the last two years of his life, William ruled as regent for the child King Henry III. During that time, William pardoned the former rebels to restore peace, reissued Magna Carta under his own seal, and made peace with the French. William died two years later, being invested as a Knight Templar and interred at Temple Church in London, where his effigy still rests. Knights hailed William Marshall as the greatest knight and the flower of chivalry. While many royal courts had an officer called Marshall, across Europe, William Marshall was simply known as THE Marshall. And that wraps things up for this episode of The Legendarium. I hope you enjoyed it. If you like what you saw, press like. If you want to see more, press subscribe. And if you've got anything to say, let me know in the comments section. Thanks again for joining me, and I hope you have a great rest of the day.